morning everybody. It is nice to see you on this uh, slightly chilly winter's morning. Um, I don't know what the forecast for the rest of the week is, but hopefully it's going to get a little bit warmer than it is today. Um, I think the temperatures were between 3 and 12 this morning, so, or today, so don't get, I hope so, it's not going to get very warm. Okay. Uncle Robert just said to me, Brett, can I feel warm for the so, I'll see what I can do on that front. A couple of quick announcements. It was on to Shirley's birthday yesterday. Um, I run, I've run out of hands and toes to count the number of birthdays on to Sally. How's that? I've run out of uh, fingers and toes to count how many birthdays she's had. 85. 85. Alright, so. I hope she had a good day. She did. She's got one. Very glad to hear that. She's had enough to do Thank you very much. And I love to her as well. And then we've got uh, Brooklyn. She's uh, swinging around on one arm here. Um, Tarzan had a bit of an accident, so two, one in arm is out of action. Uh, I asked her what the other person looks like if she looks like that. Then we have got uh, ladies, Lynn asks that you please remain after service. She wants to have a quick discussion with you. Alright, so please write that on your to-do list. Don't forget to go away. And then we've got uh, here again. Uh, Daniel kicked him, brought him with him again, kicking and screaming. So Davi, that is like from your for often to see. We hope you enjoyed it with us this morning. For those on our prayer list, we've got uh, Pietro and Ez, and we've got uh, little baby Netherlands. Um, who else? We have got... Any other announcements? Okay, Leroy said to say he's not bunking this morning, he's at work. Okay, he's got a function at fan court this morning. And as far as my announcements goes, that is, Auntie Marion is nice to see you this morning. Very, very nice to see you. Any other announcements? Anybody that I've missed? Welcome to our latecomers. Yeah, Chris, how's it? Yes. You can hear now. You can, you can ask Alana there to whisper in your ear. Okay, she can translate for you if you can't hear. Any other announcements? Yes, sir. Is giving the top at the end of the month? I'll announce that next, next week. Yes. That's next week. Yes. Yes. We've got a Sunday before then. Yes. That's announcements for next Sunday. Alright, any other announcements? No other announcements. Alright, if there are no other announcements, let's open our service this morning with a word of prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, another beautiful day that you've given to us, the opportunity that you have given again to us this morning to be able to assemble this morning. Father, for the opportunity that we have of coming before you and honoring, glorifying and worshipping you, Father, for everything that you have done, Father. Father, for the Jesus Christ who you sent to this world, Father, as the atonement for sin. For the sacrifice that he was willing to make on the cross of Calvary, Father. So, Father, we ask you that we may... Constantly remember his sacrifice that we may always live in the shadow of the cross, Father, remembering what your Son has done for us. Thanking you for the blessings that you have bestowed on us during the week that has gone past, Father, the opportunities that you have given to us to be able to <coughs> worship you, Father, and to glorify you. Father, for the opportunity also that we have of being able to serve you, Lord of also being able to serve one another as co-heirs of Christ Father and therefore as brothers and sisters. 
We thank you and we look forward to the week that lies before us, Father, the opportunities that you will give us to, again, to serve you and to serve one another. For the, the challenges that you bring across our path, Lord, to increase and to deepen our faith and our dependence on you. We think at this time, Lord, that of those that were mentioned on our prayer list, we think of Pietro and Ezra undergoing chemotherapy. Lord, we ask you to stay by their side, Lord. We also ask you to be with a little baby in the Netherlands, Lord. We know that every day that goes past, the little one grows stronger and has a better chance of survival. So, Father, we know that all things lie within your hands. We bring them all and we lift them all up before your throne of grace this morning. Father, we ask you also to be with us this morning, that you will guide us in everything that we do, that our worship to you might be acceptable in your sight, and will rise before your throne this morning as a fragrant offering. And we, Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Swiftly returning,
22:19. Then he took bread, said a blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In verse 20, and likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. We need to realize that while partaking of these implements, we are proclaiming the Christ's death as a memorial for God. Today I want to examine the significance of his burial place and what transpired after his body was lifted from the cruel cross. The tomb where he was laid had never been used and belonged to a wealthy follower named Joseph. He had requested that Jesus' body be handed over to him for burial. It was cut out of solid rock, single chambered, and sealed with a large stone. It was near the place of crucifixion and was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover. John 19 41. Joseph and Nicodemus were the ones who prepared the body and wrapped it in linen strips from feet to neck. Linen represented purity. The strips, as well as the body, were covered in a mixture of myrrh and aloes. This was according to Jewish tradition. It was to mask the smell of the decaying flesh. About 75 to 100 pounds was provided by Nicodemus. The mixture would dry and transform the strips of linen into a cocoon surrounding the body. It would have to be cut to remove it from the body. I'd like to read from John 20, verse 1 to 9. <clears throat> the empty tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone, the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came <coughs> and to Simon Peter and the other disciples. The one Jesus loved and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. <clears throat> There's two things of fair significance if you look at just the burial clothes that were, were, were set aside. According to Jewish tradition, when a master enjoyed a meal and was called away in the middle of it, he would fold the napkin up neatly placed it next to his plate. This would signify that he would be returning and the servant would, was to leave the table that is. If the master had trampled it up and carelessly placed it, it would mean that he would not be returning and the servant could clean up. That's the first thing. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, Lazarus still had the strips of cloth as well as the head napkin on his body and head. Jesus left behind the wrappings associated with the death, demonstrating that death could not hold him. When we commemorate his death, burial, and resurrection with partaking of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, as humans, we are very quick to forget, and therefore we partake on the first day of every week to remind us of that ultimate sacrifice that was made on behalf of our behalf. We sing a song that even tells of the 
things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus only let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own Son. I'm not worthy of the scars in His hands. Yet He chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why I love me, I can't understand. Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. His burial, his death, burial, and resurrection carries a wondrous promise to us in that if we live and act according to his will and commands, we have the hope of spending eternity with him in heaven. There is, a, however, a personal responsible responsibility as we partake of the Lord's Supper. That is that we do it with reverence, in humility, with sincerity in our heart, as well as understanding. With that, we proclaim Christ's great act of love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you once again for this time that we were able to gather together to sing songs and praise to your name. And most importantly, to remember that ultimate sacrifice that was made for us while we were still sinners. Please be with us as we partake of bread now, which resembles your body that was given up for us. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Mighty God, Father, as we bow before you, Father, we thank you for your son that died on the cross for our sins and washed us clean from it. We thank you for the blood that was poured on ever cleansing. Father, we thank you that you have been with us and that you are reminding us this morning about the cross and about the death and about the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm pressing on.
you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. And our text and our lesson this morning is entitled, The Way Back. The Way Back. There is a familiar legend that tells us that Satan put his tools up for sale, each of them marked with the appropriate price. Hatred, lust, jealousy, deceit, lying and pride were all out there on display. Apart from the rest, and marked with a ridiculously high price was a harmless looking but a well-worn tool. And one of the buyers came to Satan and he asked, what tool is this? And why is it priced so high? And Satan replied, because it is more useful to me than any of the others. With it I can pry open a man's heart with this one where I cannot get near him with anything else. It is so badly worn because I use it on almost everyone. Since few people know it belongs to me. All of us have faced discouragement at one point or another and to varying degrees. Even the giants in the flesh, like the Apostle Paul, said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we dis despaired even of life. But perhaps the worst form of despair is when we realize that we are reaping the consequences of our own sin. That we are responsible for the situation that we find ourselves in. Add to that the accu accusations of those we thought were our friends who are now blaming us for the problems because of our failure. We feel alone, rejected, and everything that we have been working towards suddenly appears to be going up in smoke. And that is where David finds himself at in 1 Samuel chapter 30. But it is at this moment of utter despair and gloom that we find one of the most encouraging passages in Scripture. <clears throat> it breaks through the storm clouds like a ray of sunshine. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And it teaches us that no matter how low we go, the way back to the Lord is always open. Failure is not final. Even failure due to our sin is not the final chapter for a Christian. Even though, like the prodigal son, we find ourselves in the muck of the pigsty, polluted by the corruption of the world, and even though the circumstances are the direct result of our own rebellion against our Heavenly Father, His grace still breaks through the doom and the gloom, and finds us there. 
even in the pigsty. We can say, like the prodigal son says, I will get up and I will go from here and I will go back to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. Luke chapter 15, verse 18. And we can be in full assurance that our Heavenly Father will see us coming from afar. He will come out running to meet us and He will come and embrace us. We will feel His love and His compassion and He will welcome us back into His presence. Note firstly how low believers can go. Those of us who are a little bit older, I'm sure remembers the Chubby Checkers song entitled Limbo Rock. And one of the words of that song says, how low can you go? The answer for even a Christian is pretty low. David was at the lowest point in his life. And as you saw from a previous lesson, his problems started out when he thought and he had lost hope. And he says in 1 Samuel 27 verse 1, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape to the land of the Philistines. Saul will then despair of searching for me any more in all the country of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. And as we saw, things started getting better for David. Saul did in fact stop pursuing him. He was given a city. He was gaining wealth and power. And things were definitely looking up for David. And as we saw, sin always works that way. It snags us, making us think that it will get us where we want to go. At first it seems like it is delivering on its promises, but then, like a credit card, payment becomes due, and life becomes very, very unpleasant. And as we saw, David's sin had gotten him into a tight spot. The Philistine king wanted David and his men to go and to fight alongside them against Israel. And David seemed at this point to have no choice. Saying no to this request would have blown his cover on the con game that he had been playing. But God graciously intervened in the fact that the other, other Philistine commanders distrusted David. <coughs> and they didn't want David and his men going with them into battle. And so Achish was forced to send David and his men back home. It was a three day journey back to the city of Ziklag, and David and his men were undoubtedly talking excitedly on the way back of looking forward to home-cooked meals, of sleeping in their own bed, of greeting their families when they got back. But as they got over the hill, and they looked forward to seeing the welcoming home of a peaceful domestic scene. All that they saw was desolation and smoldering ashes. 
the town was burnt to the ground. Their families were nowhere in sight and everything they had was gone. And these tough warriors fell apart and they wept until they had no more strength left to weep. 1 Samuel 30 verse 4 And to add to David's despair his own men, the men who had fought alongside him in battle, now turned against him and wanted to stone him. They were so bitter by the scene that lay before them. And so, in addition to David's grieving for his wives that were gone, he felt totally rejected, alone in the world. And he realized that this was because he had acted apart from the Lord. David, at this point, did not play the blame game. He did not say, Lord, why have you done this to me? Why are these things happening to me? David realized it was because of his own actions that he was in the situation that he now found himself in. But there is always a way back. There is never a point that we are so low that God's grace cannot bring us back. There is always hope in the Lord. And the only real reason that God allows His children to undergo despair is to strengthen their faith and their dependence on Him. In the God who raises the dead, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, verse 9. Perhaps we this morning feel overwhelmed and discouraged. Maybe it, be, it may be because of health problems or family problems, financial problems. Maybe we are lonely without family or friends and nobody seems to care about us. Perhaps we've, we have sinned and we feel like David, that God has cast us off at this point. But to us, to us especially, God has put this passage into the Bible in David's terrible situation to say, there is a way back. In the times of deepest despair, there is hope in the Lord. Secondly, the way back. The way back. David's experience teaches us a number of things about the way back to the Lord from our deep despair. And the first one is the way back is an intentional way. The way back is an intentional way. But David. And this is one of the greatest buts in Scripture. Everything around David at this point in his life seemed just doom and gloom. His property was destroyed or was gone. His family, his wives that he loved were gone and he didn't know if he would ever see them again. His men thought of killing him. But David, he 
intentionally, deliberately rejected the faithless gloom and gloom that faced him and his men. He intentionally looked beyond the smoldering ruins of his town and city of Ziglag and looked towards the greatness of God. David's strong intention is also seen in the Hebrew verb, he strengthened himself. It implies a continuous and persistent effort. There is nothing passive about coming back to the Lord. It happens intentionally. And sometimes, like the psalmist, we need to grab ourselves by the lapels and speak to ourselves the word of the psalmist when he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. And I, for I shall again praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. Psalms 43 verse 5. The way back is always an intentional way. Secondly, the way back is a personal way. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David knew God in a personal way. God was not just the God of David's country. God was not just the God of his father. Although David was raised in a God-fearing home, but God was David's personal God. David had enjoyed personal fellowship with God when he wrote Psalm 23, when he was out in the fields caring for his father's sheep. He knew God in a personal way in Psalm 23 as a shepherd guards and feeds and looks after his sheep. We do not know God until we know Him personally. We can know about God, but that does not mean that we know God. We can use a lot of religious language, we can attend, attend worship services, and even use eloquent prayers. But that does not mean that we know God personally. We come to know God in a personal way through faith in Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Jesus says in John 17 verse 3, For this is eternal life, that, you, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Thirdly, the way back is a repentant way. To repent means to change direction or to turn around. And as we see previously, David up to this point had not sought God's direction in his life when he made the decision to go over to King Achish, King of Gath. In fact, this move God violated God's express, express violation that they were not to make alliances with the pagans in that land. But now David is very careful to seek God's way and to follow it and obey it. In David's day, 
a person could seek God's will through the Urim and Tumim, which were two stones which were kept in the ephod, a vest-like garment that was worn by the high priest. And now David sought God's will in this way. And this was a change in direction from David's previous self-willed decision. He repented. The way back is always acknowledging that we were wrong. Turning away from that wrong and doing what God wants. Just as David now calls for these stones from the ephod in the presence of all his men. So that they can see that it is no longer David who is calling the shots. That he was seeking and then he was submitting to the will of God. Repentance often means or needs to be acknowledged in the presence of others so that they can see that there is indeed a change in direction and that there is indeed a change. Number four, the way back is a submissive way. Note in chapter 30 verse 8, J. David asks this, Shall I pursue this band? I'm sure David's men and many others wouldn't even have bothered to ask this question. Their family and their possessions were taken. They would have just said, come on guys, let's go after them. David sought God's will. David deliberately stopped and asked what was God's will and what he should do. If he should go after this band that had taken their family and their possessions. Now what do you think David would have done if God had answered no? If God had said to him, no David, don't go after them. Your wives and your possessions are gone. I think David would have submitted to the will of God. We have seen the heart of David. It was a heart after God's will. A man that God himself said was a man after his will. So David would not have gone after this man if God's answer was no. It would have been hard for David, but David would have submitted. We can't write our own terms when we come back to God. We can't say, Lord, I'll come back to you if you do these things for me. He is God. He is sovereign. He does what He wants, when He wants. Not in our time and not the way always that we want. Submission means leaving things up to God. Let Him call the shots. Whether he says it's all gone or whether he graciously gives it all back as in the case of Job we submit. Number five, the way back is a trusting way. God told David that he would recover everything and David took God at his word. He believed God and he acted upon that belief. In pursuing the band, 
fighting them and bringing back everything that they had lost. It would have done David no good to sit around and to say, sit around in his city of Ziegleg and say, I'm just waiting for the Lord. I'm just waiting for the Lord. I'm just waiting for the Lord. Genuine faith is always an obedient and an active faith. Faith doesn't sit around and say, I believe. Often in the face of overwhelming circumstances to the contrary. Then acting obediently on the word until what God promised becomes a reality. The way back is a generous way. On the way to pursue the enemy, 200 of David's men were too exhausted to continue. And so David left them behind to guard the baggage. And after they had defeated the enemy and they had regained more than they had lost, David returned with the 400 men that had gone with him to the battle and they came back to the group that they had left behind. And the men that had fought in battle did not want to divide the spoils with the men that had stayed back. Saying that we have fought in the battle, but these guys did nothing. But David did not let them act in this greedy way. He divided the spoils amongst all the men, and he also gave gifts to the surrounding cities. The point is, God does not restore us to himself so that we can live a comfortable, happy, self-centered life. Hoarding all the blessings that he has so graciously given. The problem with David's greedy men was that they thought they had won the battle by themselves. They thought they had recovered the spoil. But David, David's reply makes it very clear that he knew that it was the Lord who had given them the victory. If the Lord has given, then we must give an account of the gifts that He has given to us. As stewards, we are responsible for the gifts that we dispense to others. The Lord never gives us blessings to make us happy. He gives us blessings so that we can share them with others so that God can be glorified. And so in conclusion this morning, believers can go pretty low when they take the path away from God. But all glory, honor and praise to God because the way back is always open, even in our deepest despair. It is an intentional, personal, repentant, submissive, trusting, and generous way.
to be reminded of the lessons that we've learned. Help us to shine our light brightly in this dark world that we go through day by day. Help others to see you living within us. That they may also want to have a fellowship with you. Yes, I pray in Jesus' name.